So, with the coronavirus, COVID-19 kind of taking off, it looks like our exam, you guys are going to have two options for it, um, to take it a little bit sooner or a little bit later, and then you just pick the one that you want to take, and so, kind of keep that in mind, there'll be more information, I believe they said on April 3rd. Uh, so I'm going to start doing some reviews. Also, if you didn't hear, they're going to cut out periods 8 and 9. So basically everything from like 1945 up to today has been cut out of the AP exam. And so kind of keep that in mind. Let's see where this one went. Oh, there's this one. All right. This is the one over there. All right. Um, so... We'll do a little bit of a review here now. Um, all right, for you guys. And uh, all right, let's see what we got here. I'm on a kayak out on the lake at my house here. And so let's see what we got here, guys. So I was just going to kind of go over some of these focus questions because a lot of you guys didn't do a lot of detail or you might have forgot. Um, this is good information. It sounds like the AP exam is going to be 45 minutes long short is what it sounds like 45 minutes total and have a bunch of short response questions they haven't officially released what it exactly will look like let me put my gloves back on it's pretty cool though and uh so let's see what we got here for the <clears throat> and i caught a couple uh from today's reviews I caught a couple questions out of uh, chapter two's focus questions because with the limited size test, the small test, I, I don't think they're gonna ask anything that specific. So I kind of just cut it out here. But here we go. Uh, here's the focus questions for chapter one here. AP qu uh, focus questions, chapter one. Um, what changes was European uh, society going through right before Columbus's voyage? Well, guys, the Renaissance, I mean, think about that. The Renaissance is a big deal. The Renaissance, uh, you know, the, Europe's getting out of those dark ages, out of the dark ages. They're growing in population, growing in prosperity. Because of the population growth, there's more demand for goods. Because of the prosperity, they can afford goods, and which also increases the demand. So people are seeking new trade routes to Asia to try to get Asian spices. And so that's one of the biggest things, guys. Um, uh, you know, that's what Columbus is actually trying to do. He's trying to go east by traveling west. That's, that's his whole point. Um, people are more educated in the Renaissance. Uh, government, countries are getting stronger, more centralized governments, bigger governments. Instead of having just tons and tons of lords and vassals, you start to have one king in charge of many lords and vassals. So Europe's becoming less fragmented. So Europe is leaving the Dark Ages, the Renaissance. It's just primed to boom, prime to explore, prime to want more. Uh, a second question. You can see I just dropped the question sheet here in, in the water here, so it's a little wet. But uh, describe how the age of exploration brought forth positive outcomes, yet at the same time was an age of exploitation. And we're also going to consider uh, the Spanish, the French, and the English some of the different groups here. But guys, they say the Spanish come for God, gold, glory. And that they come for God to spread Catholicism. Uh, <coughs> and that's very important to the Spanish. Also the French. Um, uh, but especially the Spanish. And uh, they come here for gold. And that's the biggest thing. They're liter literally, Spain comes back with boatloads of gold. They have lots of gold from this. It makes other European powers want to come here for gold too because it's creating inflation in Europe and it's a great advantage to have gold. Uh, and they come here for glory, the conquistadors, to be conquerors, you know, to, to have the honor and fame and, and to win something for the crown. Spain also has the encomienda system, which turns the new world and from a land of plunder into a land of settlement and development. And you can get rewarded for developing. And you can get rewarded for, for developing your town and, 
and you can get taxes from it and you can get you know uh increase your own wealth from it and so guys uh the income and the system is a way to kind of like you get rewarded for helping take this land for spain and now i get my own land and my own land i can profit from so uh, income and it turns it into a system of uh development uh, as opposed to just the exploitation with the conquistadors and they're coming here for new products and and uh sugar and tobacco is going to become huge parts of the Spanish um, development of the New World. The French come here uh, with fewer people than the Spanish, and the English come here with the most. But the French come here with, with few women. The Spanish, too, uh, to some extent, uh, at least comparatively to the English. But guys, the uh, basically this, guys, uh, the Spanish... Uh, you know, they're, they're going to come here with a good amount of people and develop a bit, but the French never have this big population. The French never have this big population, guys. And so because they have less French women, there are more Native American relationships. There's more intermarriage between the French men and the Native American women. The French economy is mostly based around furs, trade, and it benefits both sides. The, the Native Americans think, gee, we're getting a good deal. We can get metal tools that we can't make on our own. We can get glass beads for decorations and religious uh, ceremonies. And we can get a whole bunch of things that we can't make ourselves or can't easily make ourselves in exchange for furs which are plentiful and we don't need that many of. And the French also see it as, hey, we're winning too. Hey, furs are fashionable in Paris. They're expensive in Paris. For something that's cheap to make in Paris, like a like a metal knife, you can get you know tons of uh, expensive furs for. It. So both sides really see the trade as a win-win, and the French tend to. You can find exceptions, but generalizing, the French out of those three, the Spanish, English, and French, the French tend to have the best relationships uh, with Native Americans, and it's because their economy set up to, hey. We're going to work together. You give me something, I give you something in exchange. Uh, whereas the English, you know, it's get off the land. We're going to be farming here. The Spanish, hey, we're controlling this area. This is ours, and you got to follow our rules. Now, the English guys, they're going to—they're the last of these three powers to come here. But they come here in the biggest numbers, in part because in England, people are getting persecuted for their religious beliefs. And when, when people are persecuted for their religious beliefs, it means a lot of English people are going to come over, and come over as family units, where it tends to be more adventurous French young men or adventurous young Spanish men coming over. And so when the English come over, a lot of them are coming over for economic opportunities uh, and religious freedom. A lot of the people go to the southern colonies. They're going to the southern colonies to work and become indentured servants. And there are mostly indentured servants up until about the 1640s when the English economy starts to recover and unfortunately they get replaced with slaves. Also, the indentured servants are exploited and people in England start hearing about how just bad they are exploited. So it's not really worth your time going. But guys, you look at that and... Uh, <clears throat> the indentured servants, big in the southern uh, colonies. Also a little bit in the northern colonies, but mostly the southern colonies. Religious freedom, they're mostly coming to the northern and middle colonies for that. The Puritans are probably the most famous example. For a while, it was illegal to be Puritan in England. And you can come to America, you can come to a place like Massachusetts, Connecticut, and establish freedom. And there's a lot of agriculture, land use, and this puts them at odds with Native Americans. This puts them at odds with Native Americans. And so, you, you look at this, guys, and the Native Americans, they're pushed back, they have their land taken, they're exploited. Uh, now, guys, chapter two focus questions here. I cut out the last two because I don't think they're as likely to be on there. But what were the differences between the northern, middle, and southern colonies? Well, the northern colonies, these are Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire. And a lot of these people are coming over as family units. They're not fleeing 
because they're starving and, and impoverished. They're fleeing because a lot of these people are fleeing because they're religiously persecuted back in England. And so these are Puritans mostly coming over as family units, sometimes whole little towns or whole little congregations. And the Puritans, and so because they're Puritans, the northern colonies tend to have less religious diversity. Although Rhode Island is started as a place for all Christians to have religious freedom in. Um, and the Puritans, they're very community orientated. Uh, they, they have the first public schools in America, Massachusetts and Connecticut. Hey, if you're, if a farmer gets hurt and can't harvest his crops, everyone in the town pulls together and, and, and works it together. And so they're very community orientated. Some people t describe them as selfless. Other people describe them as selfish because they believe that God has ordained them to take this land from the Native Americans. They don't need to ask. They don't need to pay for it. That God just gave, you know, this vast, it's mostly a vast wilderness. Remember, it's, it's, it's sparsely populated. Therefore, we can just come in and take and we don't need to ask permission. Um, and uh, they have a very diverse economy unlike religiously in the north you know they have they have some manufacturing starting like ship making and rope making they have less slavery and some of it is kind of religious based but it's actually mostly climate based it's not the best for the sugar it's not the best for tobacco the big crops kind of going on back there it's rockier soil shorter growing seasons so slavery never takes off you look at the middle colonies they're a little bit more like the north overall uh, Pennsylvania, Delaware, New York, New Jersey, especially economically speaking, they're more like the northern colonies. They have some agriculture, a lot of small farms, not a lot of plantations, just like the north. Uh, some small manufacturing kind of growing. Uh, some big cities, New York, Philadelphia, the two biggest cities in colonial America. Uh, and it's the most religiously diverse for a variety of reasons. Pennsylvania was founded by Quakers. Now, Quakers say we're right. Other ways of thinking are wrong. But it's a sin for us to force you. We can't force you. And so they're not going to persecute and oppress other people. Before you know it, the Quakers are a minority in their own colony. New York starts out as a Dutch colony. So you have the Dutch kind of Protestantism there that's different than the English uh, Protestantism, the Church of England. And so because of that, you have two strong, powerful groups and it just allows other minorities to kind of come in because no one has a stranglehold. There isn't a, this is a Church of England, you know, uh, uh, a way of, way of being there. And the Southern colonies, guys, the southern colonies, they're going to have the most slaves. They have the best climate for it. They have the best soil for it. And so the fact of the matter is the southern colonies, these are colonies like Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. I know we have a lot of South Carolina fans, especially in my D block. Um, but guys, uh, the southern colonies tend to have less women. It tends to be young men. In fact, at first, a lot of indentured servants, fewer women at first. They actually start advertising. Well, hey, women, there's, after a while, they get going. We have successful middle-class farmers. Move here. You can get a man. Um, and so it's a very agricultural base. They never really quite developed the manufacturing, certainly not in the colonial era. Never to any extent, like the middle colonies or the northern colonies. And the northern colonies have some... Uh, streams that later especially in the 18 early 1800s they're going to be able to use to harness to create energy for for factories but the southern colonies are going to rely on slavery um guys what difficulties did early english colonies face guys bad weather do you know they call this a little ice age a little ice ages uh, right around the year 1300 to about 1750 it's just a bad time to be growing stuff and a lot of them move to kind of areas of the country that aren't good for farming on top of it so you're going to have bad weather for farming and you're and you're moving to an area that's not great for farming so you're going to struggle uh just just right off the start the they, they, the other difficulties uh well, well first of all let me go back to the farming if you're not doing a great job farming you're going to be malnourished. And if you're malnourished, your, your immune system's down. A lot of these first settlers in places like Plymouth, founded in 1620 by the Pilgrims, not the Puritans. They're similar to the Puritans. And Jamestown, 1607, uh, 
they have poor immune systems and they're going to be more susceptible to disease and, and getting sick. But they're also not getting along with Native Americans quite a bit. You know, Jamestown constantly fights with Native Americans. And they also don't get along with other Europeans. I mean, they're constantly afraid of being attacked by the Spanish. Um, and, you know, later on, maybe not the early colonists, but, you know, but colonists. Uh, the French and Indian War, also known more politically correct as the Seven Years War. You know, between the French and their Native American allies and the British and the colonists. And they have a couple Native American allies, but mostly because they're paying them. But, but, the, but the, the colonies are eventually going to succeed because of tobacco. Now, kids, don't touch the stuff. It's horrible for you. You smell bad. It's expensive. It'll kill you. It'll ruin your lung, you know, your lungs if you want to run. But tobacco is what makes these first colonies profitable. And so, guys, as you look out on America, um, look out on America like I am right here today, and give me some questions. What are some things I could go over? What are some things you'd like me to spend more time on? What would be helpful for you as you prepare for the AP exam? I don't get a lot of feedback from you kids, so hey, give me some feedback. Let me know what you want, and stay safe, be smart, have a good day, kids.